I'm Sonia Sadler with Vox News, and coming up, will the COVID vaccine trans your children? But first, citizens across the nation have begun sounding the alarm with regards to a new and potentially dangerous cult known as the Church of Satan. The core tenets of this organization are radical, postmodern, Marxist notions such as tofu tastes great, and maybe we shouldn't eat animals, actually. This is a growing trend. Our viewers have reported more and more Thanksgivings ruined by shameless preaching. With Christmas right around the corner, it's becoming urgent to put an end to this madness. Well, they'll have to pry my Christmas roast out of my cold, dead hands. It's my right as an American to get heart disease. We've lost two of our very own investigative reporters to this soy-based ideology. We should have seen the warning signs. A smug air of ethical superiority, the pallor of a B12 deficiency. Before they quit their jobs to become full-time animal rights activists, we did receive word about the inner workings of the Church of Satan. In fact, we have never before seen footage of one of their so-called black masses. Viewer discretion is advised. that? Did you see those costumes and makeup? You think it's some kind of gay thing? We have consulted some experts about this footage. According to scholar and philosopher Joe Rogan, the Church of Satan is an anti-animal organization, as is evidenced by their plant-based diet. Through careful research, Dr. Rogan has established that eating plants kills more animals than eating animals. It should therefore come as no surprise that we suspect the Church of Satan is rife with animal sacrifice. PETA, a closely affiliated cult, has slaughtered over 38,000 animals since 1998, and the Church of Satan is eager to grow this number. For more information on PETA, please consult PETAKillsAnimals.com. That's PETAKillsAnimals.com. But don't search for why the Center for Consumer Freedom funds the website because that's not important, and also don't think about any of this too hard. I'm glad you could join us. Have mercy on us, Satan, according to your loving mercy, and blot out our transgressions. Wash us of our iniquity, and cleanse us of our sins, and envelop in infinite kindness those we have wronged. We should have a conversation about ritual sacrifice. Here, at the Church of Satan, we do a fair bit of sacrificing. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do to keep the gluten gods happy. Now, contrary to what the news might say, we're not lunatics. So any sacrifices that we do make to our Dark Lord Satan, cursed be their name, are strictly not conscious things. I am personally really famous for ceremonials involving garlic, tahini, chickpeas, and olive oil. The gods really love it. The problem is that not everyone has had the good fortune of being exposed to Satan's teachings on animal rights. And so there's people out there running around with George Foreman brand altars, sacrificing innocent creatures. Now, if I were you, I would say, Andy, in the current year, is animal sacrifice really a big problem? Like, who out there is pro-animal sacrifice? While esteemed intellectual titan Dr. Jordan Peterson and his weird-ass daughter and Azealia Banks aside, and you'll want to Google the last one, trust me, I think it's kind of all of us. Like, the shelves in the supermarket aren't stacked because it's logical or good, right? They're stacked because we keep buying what they are selling. If you're anything like me, you just stumbled from fortune to fortune through no accomplishment of your own, and just got exposed to the right literature. I'm not anti-capitalist because I'm just that smart. I'm anti-capitalist because I got lucky, and I read the right books at the right time, and they convinced me. Would I be anti-racism if I was born into an extremely racist family and I never got to see anyone question racism? Probably not. Trans rights, or workers' rights, or just name any arbitrary topic. If I'm not ignorant about it, it's probably because someone offered me a helping hand and pulled me up. And that's what we, the Church of Satan, are trying to do here. If you think that capitalism sucks, or that social justice is good, or really just subscribe to any leftist belief, we think that you'll wish that you'd have come across animal rights earlier. Our goal is to make a really, 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 <laughs> really uh, thorough case for animal rights. We want to show that you are already pro-animal rights and just don't know it yet. So come taste the sacramental soy milk 
and try a B12 wafer and just settle in. Today we're going to set down the foundational building block for all of the theory to come. So that's well-being and harm and marginal cases, etc. And that foundation is, is that animals are conscious beings. That asterisk their being, for simplicity, that animals refers to any non-human animal with a central nervous system that is aged one year or older. But as of course you well know, the devil is always in the details. So when we say animals are conscious beings, what precisely do we mean? Well, where to start? It seems like consciousness has a different meaning to everyone involved. For some, it's metacognition. For others, intent. Someone else will talk about agency. So which is it? Well, ultimately our goal is to prove that animals are subjects of a life, as vegan sage Tom Reagan would say. We want to show that animals have interests, a well-being, and therefore, rights. So with that goal in mind, let's pick a definition. In his paper Consciousness, Dr. Thomas Natsoulis, and I fucking nailed that pronunciation, lists at least seven credible definitions for consciousness. We are going to go with the third definition, consciousness as awareness. Awareness is arguably the most fundamental definition of consciousness as any other definition presupposes it. Awareness here is, and I quote, the state or faculty of being mentally conscious or aware of anything. Well, that narrows things down. What does aware of anything mean precisely? Well, just what it says on the tin. An object of awareness could be anything, like an external object or a mental occurrence. For example, it could be what an animal perceives in the moment about its surroundings or companions. But it could also be a mental occurrence, like memories of past perceptions or anticipations of the future. And voila! An adequate definition of consciousness. Who could argue with that? I'm really sorry to do this to you, but meet Rene Descartes. Now, for those unaware, Descartes is some loser from the 17th century. He's the I think therefore I am, cogito ergo whatever guy. You know, given some of Rene's beliefs, you really have to wonder, did he think and therefore did he exist? Scholars remain divided. And yes, I'm going to steal from the cat girl channel. If she didn't want to be stolen from, she shouldn't be so good. Anyway, let's get back on track. Renee's favorite pastimes included smoking way too much of whatever past to read back then and being the thought leader of a dog torturing cult. Let's consult the sacred texts. The Cartesian scientists administered beatings to dogs with perfect indifference and made fun of those who pitied the creatures as if though they felt pain. They said the animals were clocks, that the cries they emitted when struck were only those of a little spring that had been touched, but that the whole body was without feeling. They nailed the poor animals up on boards by their four paws to vivisect them, to see the circulation of their blood, which was a subject of great controversy. Not a fun read. Maybe don't vivisect live dogs? Disappointing. But wait, there's more! One of the most prominent Cartesians at the time, Malbranche, kicked a pregnant dog. And when someone asked Malbranche to maybe not kick pregnant dogs, he replied, what, don't you know that they don't feel? Now, I think that you and I would be pretty much content dismissing Rene and his merry gang as lunatics. But these people honestly believed that they had reason on their side. So how did Rene do it? How do you not alone convince yourself that animals aren't conscious, but convince other people so thoroughly that they're cool with kicking pregnant dogs? First of all, what did these lost children believe? The classical interpretation is that Cartesians thought of animals as just machines. Beautiful and exquisite, but still just machines. So exquisite that only God could have made them. Checkmate atheists. But some maintain that there may be hope for Cartesian souls. Since Rene is dead, the Church of Satan has repossessed his belongings. And in a letter to Henry Moore, he wrote, I am speaking of thought, not of life and sensation. I do not deny life to animals, since I regard it as consisting simply in the heat of the heart and I do not deny sensation, insofar as it depends on a bodily organ. And you can imagine our joy and excitement, since for just a second, Rene's soul was closer to salvation. It's hard to read that quote about life and sensation and not conclude that Rene thought animals as conscious. But I'm sorry to tell you that our archivists have discovered Rene Descartes' problematic tweets. Pause and read them if you can bear the disappointment. Maybe those tweets should have stayed in the drafts, Rene. But here's a short summary. First, you must know that Descartes was very confused. He was a dualist, which means that he thought that there are two planes of existence. 
the good old-fashioned physical plane, which we all know and love, and the ethereal one, where the minds are. Since minds and bodies exist on separate planes, René thought that he had proven that you don't need a physical brain to think, which honestly explains quite a lot. Second, according to the tweets, Descartes conceptualized sensation as having three different grades. The first grade of sensation is the purely physical process of perception, so nerve cells detecting stuff and photons hitting neurons. This is all a physical, mechanical process that is happening on the material plane, and so there's no awareness yet. The second grade of sensation is this material stuff interacting with the ethereal realm. So this is how material stuff is perceived by your ethereal brain. And precisely how this physical plane is interacting with this ethereal realm is a subject of great controversy, and uh, honestly they haven't quite solved it yet. The third grade of sensation takes place entirely in the ethereal plane. So this is all about your mind and the inside of your mind and reasoning. There's no more any physical plane stuff, it's all happening in the ethereal plane. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is that René denies any kind of mind to animals. According to René's ethereal mind, only humans have like an ethereal aspect to them, whereas animals exist exclusively on the material plane. So, since the second and third kinds of sensation require an ethereal mind, and since Descartes denies animals any kind of mind, Descartes therefore denies animals the second and third kinds of sensation. And now we can finally understand precisely what it was that Descartes was saying in that letter to Henry Moore. René does not deny animals life insofar as life consists of purely physical processes like the heat of the heart and the pumping of blood, like clockwork. René does not deny animal sensation of the first kind. He does not deny them sensation insofar as sensation is a purely physical process. There is no awareness here. Descartes simply grants animals physical existence. All the awareness stuff is tied up with the ethereal plane. So this was, and kind of is, what René is selling. So now let's look at how he sold it. There's two main sales pitches. The first one's pretty bad. It centers around the idea that humans have souls. But humans also have to be very special, so non-human animals can't have souls. And sweet beans, that's the beast machine. All right, now it would be a little YouTube circa 2016 of us to examine that argument, so let's look at the stronger line of Cartesian reasoning. Occam's razor dictates that the simplest explanation is usually the best one, right? And the simplest possible explanation for animal behavior is that animals are mechanical clocks and simply react to external stimuli. So how is this wrong? Well, Descartes' line of reasoning denies consciousness to humans as well. After all, why can't we say that humans are mechanically reacting to stimuli, same as the animals. That's precisely what La Mettrie, another prominent French philosopher, had to say. La Mettrie had once fallen sick with fever, and was struck by how much a disturbance in the body affected one's thoughts. His atheistic materialism was so poorly received he literally had to flee France. Again, people were really into the humans have souls idea at the time. Fun fact. Lametri was such a hardcore hedonist, it's said he died by eating too much of his favorite food, pheasant pâté with truffles. What a way to go. Anyways, Descartes has a response to this humans are machines charge, the language test. He argues that it's only creatures that are capable of language that are conscious. And fair enough, conscious beings can tell us they're conscious using language. But what about babies? Babies are clearly conscious, but haven't acquired language yet. So what's that all about? Descartes would retaliate by saying that it's only creatures that are potentially capable of language that are conscious. But that doesn't work either, since he hasn't provided any link between the capacity for language and consciousness. And what about from birth disabled humans that are incapable of speech? Are they also just machines? Can we get some answers, Renee? And with that, we have put the horse before Descartes. Ugh. And anyway, our Dark Lord Satan, cursed be their name, has revealed unto us through the dead wheat scrolls the theory of evolution. Shocking though it may be, humans did not spring into existence out of the bussy of whatever divine patriarchal figure 17th century philosophers might enjoy theorizing about. It was genetic mutation and natural selection that got us into this mess. 
and those exact same processes give us good reason to endow animals with consciousness. Though you may not feel like it after eating two tubs of vegan Ben & Jerry's and binging all four seasons of The Good Place in one go, you are what peak performance looks like. Given the fact that consciousness aids survival, it's perfectly reasonable to conclude that it's an evolved characteristic, and that it's shared by many species, not just Homo sapiens. And there's strong biological basis for this conclusion. After all, we're nothing but more mutated versions of our ancestors. As Charles Darwin, an esteemed associate of the Church of Satan, wrote, Nevertheless, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, is certainly one of degree, and not of kind. So any theory of consciousness has to square with this business of our ancestors, and of evolution. The problem for Cartesians is that denying animal consciousness in light of evolution is going to become very tricky very fast. And that Occam's razor that they were so keen on brandishing against us is now going to cut their own hand. Now there's still a way to attack this. Evolution puts us all in the same extended family, but perhaps humans are putting non-human animals a little too close in the family tree. To anthropomorphize something is to give something human qualities that it clearly lacks. For example, saying Dennis Prager has a soul is anthropomorphizing Dennis Prager. So the argument against us is that we're anthropomorphizing non-human animals. But that turns out to be simply wrong. It's wrong because people actually studied this sort of thing. In particular, a scientist called D.O. Hebb. Hebb and his team attempted to avoid anthropomorphic descriptions of temperament over a period of two years while keeping track of some monkeys. The results were clear. Let's see. All that resulted was an almost endless series of specific acts in which no order or meaning could be found. On the other hand, by the use of frankly anthropomorphic concepts of emotion and attitude, one could quickly and easily describe the peculiarities of the individual animals. The point here is that describing animals as though they are conscious works really well, and attempts to avoid using language that implies consciousness fall apart. Even in the face of all this, there are still people denying non-human animals their consciousness. We call those people human chauvinists. Now, if I were you, I'd be asking, what in the world is a human chauvinist? And please, God, how do I avoid being called one on Twitter.com? Human chauvinism is the opposite of anthropomorphization, in that it's a bias against acknowledging human qualities in non-humans, even though those qualities are clearly there. There's quite a few people out there that hold this humans are superior attitude, and they shun any suggestion that we're actually quite similar to non-human animals. And when you point out that all the evidence suggests that they're wrong, they accuse you of being an over-empathetic moron that can't help but let feelings get in the way of science, and they accuse you of anthropomorphism. But by calling anthropomorphism here, they're not calling out someone else's bias, they're just revealing their own. And we all know the type of person likeliest to claim human superiority. The alphaist male in the Walmart aisle. The guy who says, man has dominated nature and talks about the food chain, and about how humans are the apex predators. And it's like, Jeremy, my dude, you're not an apex anything. And going to the store to pick up Doritos doesn't count as hunter-gatherer behavior, or as a part of the paleo diet, or whatever bullshit Joe Rogan tells you to do. The point is that while I do think that humans are all right, and um, I really like what they've done with the prefrontal cortex, ultimately they're still just another animal. If anything, doesn't the fact that we have more power in the animal kingdom just mean that we have more responsibility? Did we not learn anything from watching Spider-Man? And taking all of this combined leads us to the cumulative argument for animal consciousness. And it goes like this. 1. Proof by contradiction. If we assume that animals are unconscious, this leads to all sorts of weird contradictions, like unconscious children or unconscious disabled people. Since assuming animals are unconscious results in these paradoxes, this kind of points to the fact that the assumption we made was a bad one. 2. Denying animals consciousness goes against evolutionary theory. And coming up with ways to keep evolution but still deny other animals consciousness quickly violates Occam's razor. 3. Consciousness works pretty well as an explanatory variable, just like your ex's astrology charts. If we assume other animals are conscious, their behavior becomes pretty simple to explain. Taken together, I think these three points provide a pretty strong cumulative argument for animal consciousness. But if you would rather hear it from some actual scientists instead of some shitty armchair philosophers, here is a document we saved for last. In 2012, Dr. Stephen Hawking got together with a group of big shots from the world of cognitive neuroscience, and together they declared, 
in the Cambridge Convention on Consciousness that the absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing affective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neurological substrates along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Right, well that was a lot of scientific jargon to throw at you all at once. If you want to know the specifics, you're probably going to have to use Google. But we'll translate that last bit for you. There's a lot of biological evidence which allows us to conclude that non-human animals are conscious. Now you may be saying to yourself, look, this video has amazing production quality, impeccable writing, and extremely attractive hosts, but who is it for? What is the purpose of this video? Who out there is denying animals consciousness? Well, as was said before, the first purpose is foundational. Our goal here is to build animal rights from scratch, and that means nothing is taken for granted, not even consciousness. Cartesianism is the strongest line of reasoning that denies animals consciousness, so here we are. The second purpose is more important. While few people explicitly deny animals consciousness, implicitly, we all do it, every day. You can't take one step in this capitalist hellscape without billions of dollars of psychological machinery trying to convince you to eat some poor cow. And when it's you and that poor cow versus billions of dollars worth of advertising, you and that cow will always lose. From birth, we've been conditioned to view animals as consumables by parents who just learned from their parents. There are ad gag laws which make it illegal to film at factory farms. There are constant manipulations by the meat industry to refer to animals as livestock instead of living things that are being killed. There are colossal lobbying groups which market fairy tales of happy cows and utopian farms. And lastly, there's us. It's hard to confront the fact that we're part of something so horrible, even if it's not our fault. There's just so much shit we need to confront, and it's just easier to look the other way. So this video, like all the other Magna Opera videos that are yet to show up on this channel, is for the animals, and it's for you. You know, we like to talk about fully automated luxury gay space communism, but there's rows of chopped up dead innocents within walking distance, and nothing gets done, and no one gives a shit. And it's not because we're cruel, it's because the truth has been hidden from us on purpose. The less you and I care, the more money they can make. You and I will set up rigorous arguments for animal rights, so there's a deep understanding as to why this is all fucked up. Animals are friends not food is a cool t-shirt, you know, don't get me wrong, but we want something bulletproof. A good luck arguing with this position, and obviously establishing animal awareness is step one. You and I will look at how the way you think of gods as big structures have managed to dupe us all into thinking that you can buy a piece of dead cow with a picture of a happy cow in the packaging and not see the problem. You and I will pick apart the system and see the workers that it exploits, the animals that it butchers, the planet that it pollutes, and the consumers that it manipulates. You and I will do the honestly difficult emotional work of confronting the bullshit that we have internalized. You and I will understand yet another way in which our world is a systemically horrible place. But in order to change anything, we first have to be aware of it, right? You and I will make a dent. And isn't that all that we can hope to do?